In the summer, we obviously played Scotland. We drew nil nil. Yeah. I didn't have the best of games and see myself was trending. It was like 30,000 tweets about me. I thought, oh no, what is going on here? So I ended up, honestly, I deleted my Twitter account for like a good two weeks. I didn't go on it. I didn't read it. Yeah. And obviously after we beat Germany, everything was positive. And, you went uh, back on it again? Yeah. <laughs> there you go, come back in. <laughs> For me as a kid, all I ever wanted to be was a footballer. How do you tell your friends that, that you've been released by Chelsea? Oh, hang on, he's just put oh, that in. He's just... <laughs> I want to win it all. If you've not got that ambition, you know, why are you playing? I've not spoken to a football player at your age that's a switched on from a media perspective. Carragher's in trouble, isn't he? I'm yeah. that, but he's gone. Carragher's a goner. Oh, he's, <laughs> he's a goner. Done he's gone. I'm coming for him. <laughs> <laughs> On this episode of The Overlap, I travel to Kingston upon Thames to speak to one of English football's brightest young talents. Declan Rice has developed into one of the best midfield players in the Premier League, playing a pivotal role for club and country. We talk about his early release from Chelsea, West Ham, England, how he looks after himself off the pitch, and his aspirations for the future. Declan, welcome to the Overlap. We're in Kingston upon Thames, a place which is very close to your heart, the Thickeries Lane Recreation Ground. Go on, tell us a little bit about it. Well, it goes back generations upon generations, really. It's where my mum and dad first met, where my brothers grew up as well, and then obviously they passed it on to me and where I spent most of my childhood as a kid and where I played a lot of my football. Humble? Yeah, very. It's, it's always nice to come back. It's always nice to come over and see the kids. Still got a lot of friends here I see to this day. And I think it's so important to stay connected to this place, you know, because it's played a massive part in my childhood as a kid. You just telling me before that you came here last week? Yeah. Because you were bored at home? Yeah, I was sat at home. Uh, I got home and my dad was sat in the office. I went, I'm going to go over and play snooker. And he said, yeah, go on, go do it. It was good to come over. I spent an hour and a half just playing snooker, having a chat, general catch up. Yeah, it was amazing. So how many times a week would you come here when you were younger and, and who would you come with? Oh, honestly, it was endless. I'd, pretty much every day I'd be here, every day. After school, I'd get my mum to pick me up and when we'd leave in the morning, I'd say, bring my clothes later, take me straight to the adventure. <laughs> and we'd get in, there'd be a group of 10 of us, a load of my mates back then, who I still speak to now. All we'd do is just play football. Is this the area that you play or do you play over there somewhere? So, yeah, when we first started, it was always it was always on the grass, on the tournaments. That it's not was great, the, is it? No, do you know what? It was better. <laughs> it was better. Dan lined it all out and uh, it was special. Then we moved into the cage, which is in there. Yeah. And we'd play all the time, Tuesday, Thursdays, whenever, really. So how does a young, talented footballer like you get spotted here when you went to Chelsea Academy when you are old? first went to Chelsea when I was eight, but that was because my cousin Taylor was already at Chelsea. Right. And uh, his dad, Nick, to be fair, put in a good word for me because I was always playing with my older brothers. It was yeah. weird, but I'd be playing, be playing over here with 13, 14 year olds at the age of eight. And uh, everyone knew I had a little bit of talent. And lucky enough, he just managed to persuade the scout to get me down there just to have a little look. And it weren't straight into the academy. It was like a foundation thing. Right. And first of all, it was that like once or twice a week. And then they really like look at me and give me a six week trial. And at the end of the six weeks, we played Swindon. I remember we, we batted them like 9 1. And Jim Fraser at the time, the academy manager, came up to me and said, Look, we want to offer you a contract. What did that mean at that time for you in terms of what impact did it have on you when you got offered that contract at Chelsea when you were so young? Yeah, it was crazy. It was absolutely unbelievable just because of the fact that I'd never played, you know, Sunday League football, mini leagues. So to go from doing nothing to then into a little full time programme, you know, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturdays training and play Sundays, it was. A bit of a whirlwind really. You're a nine or ten, you're just enjoying your football. You're just so happy to be training and, and playing with your mates. And obviously I've I've met some people at that time and now so close to me as well. Were you allowed to still come down here or did you have to give all this up when you went to Chelsea? No, nah, so this was still a massive part of my life up until I was 14 because obviously I had to move to West Ham then. But yeah, I was still coming down here playing all the time. Tournaments on a Saturday, I'd be training at Chelsea at like half nine, tournament here would start at one and my dad, I remember, used to say, don't come over, don't come over. He'd be stood up on that bridge watching me. You're not allowed to play, I'm, I'm playing. <laughs> so uh, I'd still try and play and obviously come down and have, have fun as well. What was your dad like when you were younger in terms of advice? What sort of things would he say to you? Do you know what? I was really lucky with my dad because I've, I've seen it now. When I go back and watch academy games, you know, there's a lot of parents that put pressure on, on their yeah. kids on the sidelines and where he'd done it with my with my two older brothers, he didn't so much put pressure on me. He just kind of let me play and enjoy it. I feel like that really helped me, you know. He didn't really put pressure on me as a kid. If I had a bad game, I knew I had a bad game. I always knew. Well, and you never, wanted, then? You, you never want to hear it from your dad, do you? It's well, like, go I away. To, I used to get, what was up with you today? Yeah, <laughs> literally a little line like that, and you'd be sat in the car thinking, what is going on here? Um, but no, he's, he's been amazing for me. Even now, like, 
obviously now I'm playing in the Premier League and before every game I get a text, just do the basics, do well, start well, win your first header, win your first tackle. Every game it's like, it's just special. We've got that relationship where it's where it's really good and obviously he's a massive part of where I am today. It sounds like you're getting messages because I, I, I always remember my mum used to send me a message before every game and then my dad used to come to the games and I used to wave at him. It's almost like comfort. But you're getting messages that I would have thought that people would send in my time, you know, win your first tackle, yeah. make sure your first pass is good. Yeah. And they still work for you, do they, now, even at this stage? Yeah, 100%. I think, like you said then, in your time, that would have probably been the main thing. Like, yeah. win your first tackle, win your first header. But my dad's always been, you know, if you start the game quick, you know, and you're ready, you're on your toes, you're going to go out there and have a good game. And, you know, for me, it's always first, it's, it's always so important, whether it's your first touch or, like I said, it's your first tackle. If you, if you start the game off right, you know, you're in that mindset to go on and, and try and have a good game and push on. When I watch you, I always think that you are a bit of a throwback, that you, you know, as you say, could, could you play 20 years ago? I always think that you are a throwback player. Yeah. You could play 20 years ago, and obviously you can play today as well. Yeah. Is that because of this upbringing, the dad's messages, the way you see the game? Yeah, definitely. I think as a kid, I was always the one that, you know, loved to get dirty, loved to throw my body on the line, loved to get a tackle in. And, you know, that's always kind of stayed with me. And obviously having my dad and my brothers as well. My brothers always text me, go on, go, like, first tackle, make sure you smash someone, like win the first tackle. <laughs> and it's always, it's always been on my mind. Like, I just always want to do well, start quick. And obviously when I play in the Premier League, like you said, now the game's evolved so much. But if I probably could have played 20 years ago, I would have probably loved that as well, 100%. You'd got less yellow cards, wouldn't you? <laughs> but you know, I'm picking up more and more yellows recently. Well, you like, will. I know, I know. I'm a bit disappointed with that, though. I need to, <laughs> need to slow that down. I'm getting suspended. Tell us the difference in the relationship you have between sort of like your dad, who obviously now is representing you, and then your mum in terms of how that differs and what comfort she gives you around your football. Do you know what? My mum is so into her football as well, like massively. She'd be sat at home and should be watching games all the time. We sat there with my dad. Um, so they're both pretty much on the same level in terms of my football. My mum's, she kind of doesn't talk to me about it as much. I'd, I'd always kind of have to bring it up with her. Um, whereas my dad, you know, he always wants to start the conversation, have a chat just generally about, you know, training. I was training today. I get a call every day. I was training, how did you train? And even when we go home, we sit there and watch games together and have a little chat. So I feel like I've got the pair of them where it's, you know, it's really comfortable for me to talk football. I never had a bad game according to my mum. Is your mum the same or is she a bit more honest? Do you know what? No, my mum tells me. Oh, does she? Yeah, I know, oh, I know, I, yeah, I know, I know myself personally when I've had a yeah. bad game and I know when my mum thinks I've had a bad game because she won't text me after the game. <laughs> I know I'm in a bad book, so I'll get home and she'll go, she'll go, oh, he got the better of you. And it's like, oh, so frustrating to hear that from your mum. <laughs> So let's just walk into the youth centre and you, you're talking to us about Chelsea Academy, but you had a pretty harsh experience, didn't you, at the age of 14? Yeah, extremely tough. Obviously, I was released at 14 by Chelsea, something that I'd, I didn't expect at all. You know, it was all I ever knew as, as a kid. You know, it was my whole life, you know, going there, training, the mates I'd met. And honestly, I felt like that was it. You know, I was gutted. I mean, my dad coming home telling me after school, but. Somehow, I don't know what happens. I feel like clubs let on and obviously uh, other clubs find out before you get released about, you know, whether you're going to be released or not. And that night I actually went and trained with Fulham. The night I got released. Straight the back day, on the bike. The day I got released, I went and trained wow. with Fulham that night on a Wednesday. And then on the Thursday I was at West Ham. My dad drove me to Chapel Heath and, you know, my kind of, obviously I was gutted, but I, I needed to kick on and, and push again. I mean, was you feeling upset, anger? Were you a little bit embarrassed about telling your mates that you've been released? Because there's a bit of that when you're younger, isn't there? You're a footballer. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think the fact that, like you said there, that was a big one about it, was, was the embarrassment of it, you know. How do you tell your friends that, that you've been released by yeah. Chelsea? That was a tough one. Also shock, obviously upset, obviously being, like I said, Chelsea as a kid, it was all over news. So I thought, where am I going to go? What am I going to do from here? There's a massive thing, isn't there, about the mental health and well-being of players who are released. Yeah. Not just, I mean, I saw players released at 16, 17, 18, 15, yeah. 14. Do you speak to players now about that in the youth team at West Ham? Yeah, I've had, I've, I've had conversations with kids in the academy at West Ham, just in terms of you know, general stuff about whether they're going to be leaving to go on loan or whether they're not going to get a new deal at West Ham. Obviously, they're a bit older than I was, but I feel like I've been in that position before. I know what it's like and I know the experience. So if I can help anyone and give him my advice on it and give him my support, I'll always try and do that. Would your advice be just off what you did? I mean, you straight away went and played at other clubs. Would you just say, go back, you know, carry on playing straight away, get on with it type thing? Yeah. That's the best thing to do. 100%, yeah, because, you know, for me as a kid, 
all I ever wanted to be was a footballer, whether that was in any league. And, you know, I was going to really push myself and, and give it everything I can to make sure I could have the career that you know, I wanted as a child. Why at 14, looking back now, would Chelsea let the player that you are now go? <sighs> honestly, to this day, I still honestly don't know the exact reason. I wish I, I wish I did. I think it was probably down to the fact that when I was a kid, I was actually tiny. I was going through a massive growth spurt at the time. You know, my body wasn't all connected together. My running pattern was really weird. Technical ability was fine, but in terms of the physical aspect of it, yeah. the running, I was, I was struggling. I couldn't keep up with, with other kids. And I think maybe in the end, maybe that was a thing that they thought that I couldn't probably grow out of. But I feel like, you know, everything happens for a reason. And, you know, maybe if I, if I stayed at Chelsea and got that contract, I might not be where I am today. Even West Ham, they were actually going to release me as well. And I don't think no one knows that. You've had two massive setbacks. You were the underdog, weren't you? Yeah. You had to keep proving people wrong. My mum even come up to West Ham to the digs. She wanted to drag me out because I'd call her up upset. I was really struggling. So you were released by Chelsea at the age of 14, yeah. but you were still coming down here and playing in this cage. Yeah, I was, I was still trying to get down here as, as much as possible. Obviously, I had to move to West Ham, but still on weekends, I was trying to get down here as much as, as, much as I can to play and, and see everyone. But yeah, in this cage is where I used to spend most of my childhood. <laughs> so you moved to West Ham at 14, yeah. which is, just tell everybody well, how far is it away from here? Well, it's about two hours away. Obviously, I was living at home with my mum and dad and it was basically a whole new life. You know, Fulham offered me a contract, West Ham offered me a contract. With Fulham, I could have gone school locally, stayed at home. Yeah. Or West Ham, it was move school, move into digs. And obviously not getting to see my parents was really tough. At the start, it was horrible. My mum even come up to West Ham to the digs and she wanted to drag me out because I'd call her up upset. You know, I was really, really struggling because I'm so close to my family. But there was no reason for me not to love it. It's the digs where, obviously, Carrick grew up, the foe, everyone. It was the, it's the famous digs that everyone obviously all speaks about. And it's unique because there's actually, on a full night, there's 22 boys in one house. Like, it is split into two. So there was nothing for me not to love about it. It was just more the fact that I wasn't getting to see my parents. Yeah. When I was playing football, I was fine. It was just always dreading going back to the house yeah. because it wasn't home. Yeah. But once I got out of that mindset, it becomes so much easier. And as I got older as well, I actually now really, really yeah. miss it. You yeah, and that's what, <laughs> I think that's what life goes like, to be honest with you. To be honest with you, you've had two massive like, setbacks, haven't you there? Rejection from Chelsea to cope yeah. with, and then you've had to leave home yeah. and go to another club straight away. Yeah. How does a young person prepare for that? I know no one feels sorry for football yeah, players. Yeah, yeah. And no one's going to feel sorry for Declan Rice. Yeah. You're playing for England, you're playing for West Ham. But yeah. it would have been massively tough at that time, wouldn't it? Yeah, 100%. I think as a 14-year-old as well, you're so young at 14. To, do, to deal with all that and, and do all that on your own was, was really tough. But I feel like me going to West Ham, it kind of turned me into a man. You know, I had to start doing stuff for myself at a young age. I had to start you know, depending on myself. When was the first point at West Ham that you thought, I've got a chance of being a football player here? Probably the first time I got on the bench, but it was always, it was always really tough for me at West Ham because even West Ham, it's a, it's a crazy story because they were actually going to release me as well. And when, I don't think no that? one knows that at 16. And I don't think I've ever spoke about this. It was a 50-50 decision. Half the coaches were saying, keep him on. And half the coaches were saying, we're not too sure. We're not too sure what's going to happen. When we played a game against Fulham, I was 16, I played up for the under 18s that day. I played at centre half. And Terry Wesley, after that, he gave me my scholarship. But there were five other lads that had a, a one year scholar and a three year pro. So I only ever got a scholarship to start with. What was that, one year or two years? So that was a two year scholarship. There were five, five lads that got a one year scholar, three year pro. And the promise of professional. Yeah. And that, they, that was a guaranteed pro for them. But so. that's like a rejection as well, isn't it? Really? Yeah. yeah. I, that used to happen at United sometimes. You get yeah. lads that got two year. YTS and pro, yeah. but we, some of us would just get a YTS. Yeah. Do you know what, for me, I felt like with the five boys that got their pro and obviously me that only had a scholar, it was in my mind once I got that, I need to now work towards getting that pro contract. Yeah. So I had something that I was always pushing for. I was yeah. always driving myself on to get better, doing extra work. And then once I got my first pro contract, I'd worked so hard for it, I was playing really well. And then I just pushed on again. And I think within a year I signed another pro. I feel like me not having that pro to start with really did help, you know, because I didn't stay complacent. I was always wanting to get to the next level. Do you think there is, I mean, there is that argument. It's usually from older pros or older people in life that, you know, you get too much too soon yeah. and it's bad for you. You were the underdog, weren't you? Yeah. That had to keep on sort of pushing and proving people wrong. That's exactly it. I feel like 
even now, me being where I am, I see kids now, and obviously they're offered pro contracts or they're negotiating pros, and it's like some of the money they're asking for as kids, you think it's crazy. You like, can't you're just, be saying that at 23. No, I know. <laughs> I, I, I know like, when I, if I hear about stuff at the yeah. club, like younger lads, or if I just if I hear about stuff in general, it's like. Did it shock you even now at 20? Because I would, uh, that, yeah. that stuns me. Because at 46, I sometimes say money that's been offered to 18, 19 year olds, and I would be shocked. Cause yeah, it, it's just but, because it's what I've been through, you know, yeah, what I've yeah. kind of been through and what I've had to do. I was happy just to sign a scholarship. I was happy yeah. just to sign my first pro. Like, you sh it's such, a, it's such a, a proud moment just to do that. I feel like money, when you're that age, it should be the last of your worries. Just yeah. to sign that first pro contract should be a proud moment in itself, and then you can kick on and push on. When was the first time you had an agent? Because we're talking about money. When was the first time you had an agent and had someone represent you? I was, I was 17 when I first had an agent. You must have been bad then when you were younger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You tried to get rejected <laughs> twice. No agent came knocking on your door. Do you know what it was? I feel like with agents, you know, I've, as I've got older, I've kind of understood them a little bit more. They all kind of promise and say the same things. You know, something now that I've got older, I see it when they're around younger lads. I'm kind of happy I've come away from all that. It's murky, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. And I feel like young young lads, you know, they can get sucked into, you know, being sold something that won't end up being what they're being told. And I wasn't really like that. My dad's really strong, um, and my brothers as well switched on, got my best interest at heart. So they would never ever let me get mugged off or anything like that. But yeah, I had an agent at 17. Obviously, left him two years later, and was with a, was with another agent as well. And honestly, it was unbelievable. Like, not, not a bad word to say against against any of them. It was just that I felt like the time was right. I felt like it was at a point where I was in a position where my family could look after me and I felt like that was the best decision for me. It's the first time I've spoke to you at length today, but I see a lot of what me and my brother went through as youngsters, where we had agents knocking on our door when we got into the first team. But in the end, we went in ourselves with my yeah. dad and you've just decided in the last sort of 12 months that your dad and your brother are going to represent you moving forward and that you are not going to have an external agent, haven't you? Yeah, yeah we've, yeah, we've decided that as a family. It was the best thing for us to do. We're such a close-knit group. And I feel like with things like that, in terms of dealing with contracts, dealing with commercial stuff, I feel like it's kept in the family. You always know where everything's going to be going with it. You can have honest conversations with each other. I just felt like it was the most, most easy thing for me to do. I feel like maybe sometimes with agents, you don't get to hear the full story. They maybe tell you one thing and, hear another, and you hear another thing. So I just felt like the family was the right thing to do. And yeah, I'm really happy about it. Just something gives me a warm feeling hearing you say it, because I have been, to be fair, for 20 odd years saying I think football players should take control of their own life and their own destiny and make their own decisions. Yeah. And you're doing that now. What would be the downside to that in terms of, you know, your dad's never been an agent before, you're dealing with big, big clubs, you're yeah. dealing with West Ham, you're dealing with England, you're dealing with commercial contracts. How do you go about sort of making sure that you are best protected? I think you've done the right thing, but I, yeah. I, you know, I used to go, for instance, and consult with the PFA or yeah, try yeah, and get yeah, information yeah. from other players. How do you get the information that you need? Even with my dad obviously doing it, of course, he's going to need advice as well. You know, it's important yeah. for him to meet people and obviously get the best advice, you know, from lawyers, from other people. I feel like that's how you learn about stuff. I feel like with me and my dad, he's, he's really switched on. You know, he ran his own business for, for 25 years. You know, he dealt with stuff like this all the time. Obviously, football contracts is completely different. But in terms of, you know, standing his ground, knowing my worth, which is the main yeah. thing, you know, he knows, he knows what's best for me. This is a compliment. I've not spoken to a football player at your age that's a switched on from a media perspective and able to articulate the message probably ever, to be honest with you. I mean, I look back at a 23-year-old Gary Neville, I was nowhere near as articulate or as switched on as you are. Where's that come from? Is that coaching at Chelsea? Is that your upbringing with your parents? Is that West Ham? Is that your own sort of feeling that I've got to go out there and do interviews? No, do you know what? I can't, I really honestly can't put it down to anything. I just think as a kid, I've always been so outspoken, outgoing. I'll, I'll speak to anyone. You know, I'd always have a conversation with anyone. I'm always laughing, I'm always smiling. I've been brought up around, my mum and dad who have brought me up amazingly, my brothers. I've always kind of just, taking everything how it is and that's yeah. just how I am as a person you know I take each day as it comes and I'm really pretty relaxed and chilled out about stuff. It's a long way in the future 35, 36, 37 when you're going to retire but do you have any idea now of coach, media, yeah. business what, what sort of thoughts have you got in your head I know it's a long way to yeah, go. Yeah it is a long way. Carragher's in trouble isn't he? Yeah. Like, but he's gone. Carragher's a goner. Oh, he's, he's a goner. Done he's him. gone. I'm, I'm coming for him. Um, <laughs> he's, uh, do you know what? Uh, yeah, I, I would love to do punditry when I'm older. Something I 100% I'd love to do. I watch you and you and Carol the time Monday night, Friday night. 
on Sundays as well. It's something, it's, you know, it's great insight as well. When you sat there as a player and you're listening to ex-players talk about stuff, what I love about it is you guys, what you lot say is spot on. And the average fan, they don't really understand because they've, they've never been in the game. And they always arguing against what we're saying and what you're saying. But you're always right because you've been in Not the game. Always. No, no, trust me. <laughs> some of the stuff you say as players were like, they're spot on there. But then the average fan, they'd look at that and think, hang on a minute. That's not right, but I can honestly say from, it's because they've never been in the game. They don't really understand it. So punditry is something I'd probably love to get into when I'm older. Like you said, a bit of media as well. And obviously pretty much anything like this, the overlap, doing things like this, like just going to meet people, going to meet footballers, talk about stories and getting life experiences from people. Probably, yeah, definitely media or punditry. You say pundits are always right, but three or four years ago, I'll always look at my comments around you and I thought that you were a centre-back playing in midfield. Yeah. Karen never did, said that, to be fair. Jamie read that. They always were convinced you'd be an absolute top midfield player. And I have to say, three years later, they were a lot more right than I am. <laughs> do you see yourself as a central midfield player and that's it forever? Or do you think you will at some point go back? Just so I can, so, so, so I can say that they are wrong. <laughs> do you know what? At the start, you probably was right. I was a centre-back player in midfield. I was. And you could probably see that on the ball, my defensive positioning. I was doing so much more work for the team defensively than I was on the ball. Yeah. That is true. I was probably a centre-back playing in midfield. But as time's gone on, the more you play in a position, the more comfortable you get with it. Yeah. I've always known I've had this ability. It's just, it's just confidence and putting it into place, which I've been doing this season, which is, which is good. I feel like for the moment, I'm, I'm happy in midfield, 100%. I would never complain if I have to go back to centre-back. Like the manager pulled me the other day, Dawson might not have made the game, so I was going to play centre-half. He made the game. No problem at all. I know the position. It's tough. It's a totally different game to midfield, but maybe one day when I get older, when the legs are gone, I might go back to centre half. <laughs> but at this moment in time, I'm loving this midfield right at the minute. There's been times at West Ham where it's been awful. Moyes come in and really turn it around from his first meeting. He said, look, if you don't want to be a part of it, you can all go. What is the future for Declan Rice? I don't want to have a career where I've not won nothing. I want to win it all. Hi everyone, I hope you're enjoying this episode. This is just a quick thank you to Skybet, our partners, for making this show happen. It's something I've wanted to do for a long, long time. Please subscribe, there's loads more episodes coming up and I hope you're enjoying it. Right, let's get back into this episode. Declan, tell us about this place. Oh. <laughs> Oh, you're from the wall already. Yeah, give them the shirt. This is where I spent a lot of my time as well as a kid. When it was freezing cold, raining, we'd be in here. Heaters would be on, we'd play table tennis competitions. Yeah, we'd, we'd, we'd do a bit of everything in there. But there's some special pictures on here. This is my second appearance for West Ham. I come on at Old Trafford, we lost 4-0. I come on at 60 minutes. <laughs> and uh, yeah, what an experience, it was incredible. Even like these pictures here, that's me at Wembley. Dan took us to Wembley. We played Scotland when Ricky Lambert scored the header. Yeah, I was, I was um, with coach with Roy then. Was you? Yeah. Yeah, so that's me there, stood there as you can see. That's unbelievable, yeah, that, that feels like yesterday. That. I know, and then obviously here like, in the football tournaments, that's me there. This is what we used to do out on the grass. That's my brother there. That's how long it's been going. Oh. My brother is here today, Connor. <laughs> like, he's been going for ages. So let's go back to the West Ham debut and yeah. you're in the team. Old Trafford, second game in, and at that point then, do you, think, do you feel like you belong? Yeah, I, I, I felt like, obviously I played at Burnley for a couple of minutes the season before, and this was the opening day of the season. I didn't know how the season would go, whether I'd go on loan or, you know, whether I'd even play a minute in the first team. I think I went on to play 32 games that season, mixture of starts and coming off the bench, but as soon as I got on the pitch and obviously had my first touches and, you know, I played really well that day, actually. I just felt like I'd... I'd belong there and it just felt natural. What are your early experiences in terms of travelling with the first team and all the things that a young player has to contend with? Yeah, so special, really, really special. You know, the first season I was doing it, I was on the bench like 10 times before I actually made my debut and I thought, is this moment actually going to come? <laughs> but the, the actual experience of travelling, you know, going on the plane with the first team, you know, going on the coach journeys, hotels, you know, like pre-match, the meetings, everything like that, the whole experience of the match day. Going there as kids, you know, you watch footballers getting off the bus, going down the tunnel, like with the headphones on, like, just things like that. And you think, wow, like, now that's kind of me and that's yeah. the position you want to be in. And you know, obviously at that time, I didn't know I'd go on to do what I'm doing now, but I knew that I could, I could really push and have a good career. You've been a young player at West Ham, obviously for quite some years, but there have been times at West Ham in the last few years, the stadium move, and it has been a little bit moody. Yeah. It's not always been in favour of the ownership. Yeah. How has that been for you in terms of obviously being a young player in the dressing room? Do you just sort of 
forget about that stuff or does it really hit home because obviously you are someone who's obviously come through the academy and you've been there and you've sort of loved the club yeah definitely i think there's there's been times at west ham where it's been awful we've been i think my, that season there season before it was like a relegation yeah. fight you know it was awful something you obviously didn't want to be a part of you know we had a few players in the team it wasn't going their way, turned toxic, and we wasn't getting... What, the in the dressing room it was? Yeah, just not in the dressing room, weren't turning to in terms of individuals, you know, with their ego and things like that. I shouldn't be fighting relegation, etc., etc. not putting the effort in on the pitch, not training well enough. And in the end, I feel like when you're in things like relegation, you need everyone to pull together. You need everyone to be at it, everyone be on the same page. In the end, we did get out of it because Moyes come in and really turned it around. From his first meeting, he literally said, look, if you don't want to be a part of it, you can all go. Yeah. <laughs> and everyone was like, right, we're on page here. We got rid of all the, uh, the, the toxic ones and we really pushed on. And, and since then, since he's come back as well, it's been so, so positive. The dressing room is probably the best it's ever been that I've been a part of. Training's unbelievable. The backroom staff, like I said, everyone's on the same page. So yeah, no, the club's going in a really positive direction. And what's David Moyes done that's made you now Champions League contenders? What's the thing that you point towards sort of in the last few seasons? <sighs> It's probably he's probably stabilised our stability. You know, he's made us really strong, hard to beat. We was before he came, we was leaking goals and we wasn't running hard enough. And I remember we pulled up a meet and first day got all the stats up. We was like 19th, 18th, 17th for like sprints, total distance covered. And he says that's not he's my doing team. Doing our job for us. Yeah, he's like that's <laughs> that's my that's not my team. That's not how we're gonna play. And he and he got us so fit. And us as players now, we've got like Suchek running 13k a game. <laughs> So yeah, no, we're hard to beat, you know, we're, we're good on the counter-attack, you know, we're really strong, we all know our jobs, we know how he wants to play, and I feel like, you know, that's what we've needed as, as a club, you know, we've needed a manager like him. Every time West Ham have had a great squad, it's always been sort of what would be decimated by other clubs coming in. Do you yeah. fear that could happen again? You're fifth in the league at the moment, you've yeah. got a chance to get into the Champions League. Do you mm. feel like that could happen again where clubs could start to look at players within the squad, including yourself, obviously, because the, obviously the rumours around you are big. Yeah, yeah, yeah. obviously you, you're constantly reading stuff about myself, obviously Bowen, Lanzini, um, you're constantly reading stuff about players. Of course, I feel like if you're performing well and obviously there's top clubs around, you know, there's, there's people always going to be always going to be circling. But I never actually read too much into it or believe anything until something actually happens. To me, it's just all noise and, you know, I've got to stay focused on, you know, what I've got to do at West Ham, which is perform week in, week out and try to be the best player because that's what I want to be. What is the future for Declan Rice in terms of ambition? I think the main one for me, I've always said it, is that I don't want to have a career where I've not won nothing. You know, I, I've grown up as a kid, I've seen all these top players win the, the big trophies, like yourself, win the Premier League so many times, the Champions League. Me as a football fan and also a player, I want to win the best stuff. You know, I want to win the Premier League, I want to lift that trophy, I want to win the Champions League, I want to win the FA Cups and the League Cups, you know, even stuff with England, I want to win it all. As a footballer, I feel like if you've not got that ambition, you know, why are you playing? They're the best moments of your life, you know, when you win them types yeah. of trophies. Them special days, you kind of, I've not won nothing yet, but close to obviously with England, but just I thought about it before, it's like, what would that day be like lifting the trophy? Like the, 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 the day of it, you know, the night out after, the memories you're going to have. So I definitely want to have them experiences of, of winning trophies and, and being the best I can be. We were so close to creating history. To see like Italy lifting the trophy, it's horrible. I was angry, sad, gutted. I think everyone was as well. You're a bit better than you're letting on, aren't you? <laughs> this, is, this is not going to happen, this. Oh, what a, a shot. Rap. What a <laughs> shot. Declan, this is a section called Failure is a Bruise, Not a Tattoo that relates to a not particularly great time that I had in coaching. And I'm going to ask you, what is your low point in your career? My low point in my career so far is, without a doubt, losing the Euros final. That's my lowest point that I've ever felt in football. Just the whole experience, obviously, we'd done so well the whole summer. You know, as players, as lads, we generally thought that you know, it was ours to lose really. We knew we was coming up against tough opposition. You know, they're probably the standout team of the tournament, but with us being at home and the players we had, the people we had on the bench that we could bring off with the fans, we thought that it was going to be our day. And obviously going one nil up, we started so well, so strong. And obviously the tables turned, they scored from a set piece, a little ricochet back of the net. And obviously we lost on penalties. And, you know, that feeling, you know, even just thinking now, you, I can visualise being stood there watching the penalties and it's awful, it's horrible because we were so close to creating history. What were your thoughts 
the immediate that you knew that you'd lost? What were, you know, when you went back into the dressing room, what, anything that stands out? You know, I, when I had big sort of what would be defeats in football, yeah. there are moments that stand out for something somebody said to you or someone's action in the dressing room or how, how they felt. Do you know what? It was, it was more just shock. Do you know, like when something's just happened that you didn't expect to happen, you, you can't, your emotions, your feelings, it's all a bit, you're just shocked really. You're like, everyone was quiet. You know, we was obviously out on the pitch, you know, clapping the fans, everyone was upset. Gareth said some lovely words, you know, that we've been amazing this tournament. We've made so many people proud. You know, that's, that's not the last of us. You know, we've got the World Cup coming up. We'll push again. But then even just to see like Italy lifting the trophy, things like that, you know, it's horrible. I was angry just sad, gutted. I think everyone was as well. There's one thing getting to a final, which is a good thing, but there's, you know, it's another thing losing it and there's something you never want to do, especially in the Euros final. So, probably my lowest point in my career so far was definitely losing that. When you look back upon that game, and I was at the game, what, what, is there anything that you think, oh, we maybe could have done this, or we should have done that, or anything that you think of in terms of tactics, not tactics from the manager, but yeah, on yeah, the pitch yeah. yourselves? Yeah, I think as, as players, you know, we probably could have took a little bit more responsibility and, and had the ball a little bit more. And obviously we went one nil up, we started so well. I think we had another chance to maybe go two up or we was close to going two up in the final. We was on the front foot, you know, everyone was really buzzing for it, aggressive. Tackles were going in strong, winning headers, winning the second ball. I remember the last, probably the 10 minutes of the first half, we kind of got into a zone where we was dropping back a little bit and we was pressured into Did you feel it happening? I used to be able to feel it happening in tournaments. I mean, we, yeah. we never got to a final, to yeah. be fair, but I used to feel it happening in the game, almost like that tide sort of coming in. Yeah, there. yeah, 100% that. You know, their midfield had been known all tournament for, for having a load to the ball. And probably for 35 minutes of the game, you know, they couldn't really get into their rhythm of passing the ball. And the, the space opened up and obviously their players started to get on the ball and make things happen. And we got in at half time, 1-0. We was in a great position, to be fair. You know, we thought we could go out and nick another one or stay strong, stay compact, because we hadn't been conceding many goals. Yeah. So we thought that was us, and obviously us being so strong on set pieces as well. You know, they won the first contact and the second contact. You know, put the, put the ball in the back of the net, and then their tails are up and ours are a little bit yeah. shocked. And then from there, it's always tough, you know, to get back into it, but it's where you need to go again, really. And I feel like we didn't really, we didn't really do that, which was gutting, because with the players we had on the pitch and the bench, it's a shame we couldn't, you know, nick another goal or keep more control of the ball. OK, let's talk a little bit more about England and also have a game of snooker. Nice. I'll take this jacket off. <laughs> Go on, I'll let yeah. you break. No, you can break. You need to break? Yeah, you can break. <laughs> it's like Judd Trump. You're a bit better than you're letting on, aren't you? <laughs> this, is not, this is not going to happen, this. <laughs> oh, what a, a shot. <laughs> what a shot. <laughs> I've only got this on, I'm going to have to try and pot it, ain't I? Oh. Mm. Ooh. Shot. Just take us back to that feeling after the game in the Euros where you lost and the abuse that the three lads, uh, Jaden Sancho, Marcus Rashford and Saka got in the days after. Yeah. So sort of how big an impact did that have on not just obviously them, but the rest of the lads as well? Yeah, terrible, absolutely terrible, because obviously after the game, them three were, were distraught because they'd obviously they'd missed the penalties and they're three, three top lads. I couldn't say enough about them, to be honest with you. For that to come out after what we'd been through as a country, you know, as a nation, as players, everyone was just disappointed more than anything, you know, that some people could say that type of stuff. But I feel like, if you look at Saka for this season, you know, he's, he's been unbelievable, you know, he's really bounced back. I see Sancho, he's obviously had to move to Manchester United, which has obviously been tough as well, and he's still adapting. And Rashi, with everything that he's done, you know, in terms of with his charity work and stuff like that, they're the three people you'd think least to say anything about because, you know, they're three top lads. And yeah, it was real disappointing. But when we got back together after the summer for that first group, you know, we had a chat as players and as a, as a team. and. That's what we've done really well, is stick together and, you know, we've never let anyone down with each other, so we've got a real good group there. This group of England players actually stopped a game in Bulgaria, I think yeah. it was. Yeah, we did. How close are you as a group? Cause I, honestly, people say about sort of football players nowadays and, you know, characters and leadership, but I think you are braver, you are yeah. willing to stand up more and speak more. Could you walk off a pitch as a group, do you think? And I'm not putting it on you for yeah, making yeah, a decision yeah. on that. Yeah, yeah. Do you think, have you discussed that type of thing? Yeah, yeah Gareth and, I, and the group, obviously we had a big conversation as a, as a team and 
he said he'd have no problem with us as players walking off the pitch if we wanted to do that and he would not have a problem and he'd back it 100%. Where did that right come from in terms of the group? Who stimulated that I, conversation? I, th I think we knew at the start of the week, we, we said every time we go to St George's we have like an overview of the week and we talk about obviously where we're going and we knew that it could be hostile going to Bulgaria with what's gone on there before. And it's not something you put your main focus towards obviously because the game's so important but you know you could, you know it could happen during the game. And obviously Harry Kane's the captain and we decided that if there was anything that was being said, any of our players that had been abused or anything, if they'd heard anything, they'd go tell Harry, Harry would go and tell the referee. I think the game got stopped two or three times yeah. and then we made the decision at half time. Gareth said, look, we can either stop this game now and I'd, I'd back it 100%. But I think the group of lads went, you know what, we'll go out there and win the game and we'll smash them. And I think we ended up winning like seven or eight nil and that was really, really powerful. But for people like Tyra Mings, it was, he spoke about it, it was his debut in Bulgaria. And he was subjected to obviously racial mm. abuse. So for him, on one hand, he's making his England debut, but on the other hand, he's being abused, which is which is awful. So in terms of players now still taking the knee in Premier League games, yeah. that's the, something that the majority of England players and Premier League players are behind. Is it something that you feel strongly about? Because obviously you're from Kingston upon Thames, which is a really diverse and inclusive area. Yeah, no, I think it's really important. I think, you know, some players have come out now and there's a few players at different clubs that are now obviously standing for reasons they obviously want to stand for instead of taking the knee. But I think us as England players, we had that conversation again in the summer, before the summer. We said as a group that we're going to do it. It still sends out a strong message that we're against all of that. Some people have an opinion that, it's, you know, that the message is kind of coming away from all of that now and why is everyone still doing it? But I still feel like until actually this type of stuff stops, I sort of feel like it's a really important thing to do. I've seen myself trending, it was like 30,000 tweets about me, I thought, what is going on here? Qatar isn't far away now. We know what's required, but the next step is getting it over the line. Oh, hang on, he's just put oh, that in. He's just... <laughs> <laughs> what a shot. All right. <laughs> No, you're decent. I know you, no. you're, you lied up. I used to play a lot when I was younger. Yeah. I don't often get Premier League players liking one of my tweets because usually they're, to be fair, political or <laughs> But a few weeks ago, I had a little bit of a pop around the cancellations yeah. of the games with COVID yeah. and I thought clubs were starting to take it too far. And I yeah. just saw a little cheeky Declan Rice like <laughs> there and thought, oh, that must be sort of hurting players in the dressing yeah. room. Has it started to annoy the players, the sort of cancellations a little bit? I think you hit the nail on the head, to be honest with you. I feel like the f at the start, okay, yeah, there was, with this Omricon, there was a lot of, there was a lot of cases and there was a case for games to be stopped. But obviously, like you said the other day on the telly, you said that it feels like now games are being stopped because teams haven't got their best team out. If there's genuine COVID cases within the club, of course, there's nothing you can do about it. But in terms of the fact that it's not because you haven't got your best team out, you can't play the game, I think that's a load of rubbish. Because I feel like there's kids waiting to have that opportunity to showcase what they can do. You do all your own social, don't you? And yeah. obviously, you'd have to to like me because I don't think I don't think a, I don't think a social media company would like one of my tweets. How do you see social media? I know it's a, an emotive issue for many yeah. players. They use it, but they get a lot of abuse on it. Not yeah. just abuse in terms of obviously, you know, the racial stuff, which is well and above and beyond. You know, yeah. a, that's a criminal offence. I'm talking about the abuse you get for your performances yeah, yeah. and other things. You're all on it, but then do you really like it? Mm, to be honest with you, I don't really read too much into it. Obviously, you, you see comments and, oh, hang on, he's just put oh, that yeah. in. He's just... <laughs> what a shot. He's, he's played that over, over a red as well, lovely. Um, I don't really read too much into it, to be honest with you. Obviously, I run my own social media. I know a lot of lads. I know a lot. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> it's getting so... It's Go getting on, get in. Oh, no, it's getting messy. Oh, yeah. it's a double whammy. So, like me, I obviously run my own social media because I feel like it's authentic and I feel like... Fans want to hear from the player himself and not someone who's running it off a player. I don't feel like that's authentic at all. And I feel like I know now if I can tell the difference between if a player's done it and if someone else has done it for him. Can you start calling him out for me? <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot more than you think that are not tweeting. Um, if you've not had the best game or you've had a bad defeat, do you not go on it for 24 hours, 40 hours? Or do you, do you still read the stuff when you've had like that type of bad defeat or bad yeah. game? Yeah, do you know what? I kind of just let the steam die off a little bit. So just uh, give it, yeah, just give kind it a bit of, of chill out. Yeah, give it a bit of time. For instance, in the summer, we obviously played Scotland. We drew 0-0. Yeah. I didn't have the best of games. And 
see myself was trending, it was like 30,000 tweets about me. I thought, oh no, what is going on here? So I ended up, honestly, I deleted my Twitter account for like a good two weeks. I didn't go on it, I didn't read it. Oh, so you deleted your Twitter account? No, I didn't delete the whole account, I just deleted the app. So I had the account, but I deleted okay. the app, so it stopped me going on it. So in the it. Euros, you deleted the app completely? Yeah, yeah, so after the Scotland game, I just, I come off the app until we beat Germany, which was obviously, we had to beat Czech, play Czech, it was like two weeks later. And I just thought after the Scotland game, I'm not reading that about myself because I hadn't had the best of games. Yeah. It's a tournament for England and just, I just, this was the last thing I wanted to be reading. So I just took myself off it. And yeah. then obviously after we beat Germany, everything was positive. And, you went uh, back on it again? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you <come> back <laughs> um, I didn't go back and check everything, but I read everything was more positive in a positive light yeah. about the team. And then we'd done well from that point in. So uh, yeah, I went back on it. <laughs> So who's your big mates with England? That you, what do you do then? Table tennis? Yeah. Are you on the FIFA lot? Are you on that game? Yeah, not really. Everyone plays like Warzone and that. The big thing I notice with England now when I look at the players, and to be fair, the more I reflect on this as I get older, I think it is a sad indictment on us. There were definitely clicks, you yeah. know, Manchester United, Liverpool, Chelsea, obviously lads when they broke through as well. Did you feel that there then though? When you was playing, did you think that? <sighs> or did, you, was it, did it just feel I, normal? No, I think we think that at the time we'd sit together but it was okay, and uh, the Liverpool lads would sit together and it'd be yeah. okay. But when I look back now and reflect upon it, I do think it had a, I, I used to think it didn't have an impact on the performance, because out on the pitch, there's no doubt we would yeah. be together. But then if you're not as close off the pitch, mm. I do think it causes a big problem. I think it's seeing you lot, the way in which you interact with each other, you socialise with each mm. other, you're friends with each other. I just could never bear the thought of being a friend of someone who played for another club yeah. that I was in competition with. But that's completely changed now with the Premier League players yeah. as well. 100%. I think for some reason, every time we go away of England, it's like the, the big lads play each other. So like, it's either a Manchester derby before they meet up the next day. Yeah. So it's like they're, they're playing against each other the day before, then they're meeting up and everything's just normal again. Yeah. I feel like Gareth's really got that right. You know, yeah. he's, you know, he's been really good with the group and obviously Steve Holland as well. And, you know, as lads, there's not one bad lad in that England squad, you know, you could sit with anyone and talk. Everyone's great and I feel like, like you said, that's why we've, we've really done well as a team. Is it because you think you've all come through the youth teams together or the sort of under 21s and do you think that's a factor? Or do you think yeah. just it's times have changed and we were just arseholes? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, definitely think, I definitely think times have changed. I think football's changed in general since you was playing. But I feel like a lot of the lads, obviously, like you said then, have played together at younger ages as well. Like Raheem Sterling, I didn't know he'd played with like Connor Cody when he was younger, and obviously Connor Cody now is at Wolves, and yeah. Raz is at, uh, obviously City. So them two are really close, and you would never say that, no. you'd never think that. So, yeah, probably playing playing with each other at younger age groups has probably helped as well. Who are the leaders at St George's Park? Obviously Harry, you know, is the captain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But who are the leaders that you would say stand out? Who's in the leadership group? Yeah, there's a leadership group. Obviously Harry Kane's in it, Maguire, Walks is in it, Tyron Mings is in it. I think Connor Cody might be in it as well. You know, there's a you're not in it yet? No, nah, not yet. No, nah, I'll leave that to the big dogs. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not in it at the moment, but you know, maybe one day you know, I, might be, I might be in it. But it's something that the lads have obviously got going with Gareth and it's really good. They just talk openly about stuff and if there's ever a problem, you, know, you can get the opinions of the players, and, which is really, really good. Would it be a dream to captain England? Yeah, I think that's everyone's dream. I think is it on your radar? Yeah, definitely. Even just to, to have the armband on for a game. I'm obviously young at the moment. There's a lot of lads that are captains at their club that play in the team as well. So it's tough. As I get older, that's something I'd love to do. You know, one day is, is to put the England armband on. That'd be special. I was in Russia and I remember saying when the lads got knocked out in the semi-final that I hoped that they could get into that position again. And you didn't only get into that position again, you went one further and got to a final. Yeah. And I probably thought that after the final in the Euros, Qatar isn't far away now. Yeah. What do you think? in terms of England's chances. Do you think you can go one further? Do you feel like it's a team that can win and get over the line? Yeah, and I think so. We've, we've proven we can go far now in tournaments. And I feel like that early exit of tournaments is past us now. We know what's required, but the next step is actually on the day, putting it all together and you know getting it over the line. And I feel like even from the Euro squad to the one that's going to be in Qatar, it might be a completely different squad because there's, you know, there's younger lads that are now coming through which are performing week in, week out. You know, there's older lads that might not be performing as well. So there's going to be a real mix and crop of players which I think will stand us in good stead for Qatar and we're all looking forward to it. Woohoo! Jesus! <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've left myself a shot here, haven't I? Try and swerve this around. Oh, he's missed oh. it. Oh! A foul five. A foul. Oh, you f <laughs> oh, I've lost concentration now. I, are you, yeah, you snooking me again? 
Oh. Nice. Oh, no. You wimp. So we need to see you pot in the black and saying you've won, basically. I'll try and set you up this next one. Yeah, now. Oh, no! <laughs> oh, he's killed me! <laughs> we won't set it up, we'll just do it. Brilliant. Hey, pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anytime. Thank you. Good.